everyone, welcome to Dinosaur Radio, episode number two. Uh, this is Brooks Kubik, and with me is John Wood. John, how you doing? All good. Yeah, and it looks like you've uh, done something different uh, with your beard that, uh, since we last saw you. Uh, beard, shave, and a haircut. I clean up pretty well. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm still working with the uh, the lockdown uh, haircut and, uh, and so on, so people will just have to uh, deal with that. John, what do we want to cover today? Well, uh, we are in the second week of January, so we thought it would be timely to cover some strategies for making the coming year um, a good year. Sounds good. In other words, uh, we're going to do a whole talk on New Year's resolutions, right? In a manner of speaking. Or in a manner not. I don't know about you, but I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I said it many years ago. I said, I don't believe in New Year's resolutions. I believe in setting goals. I believe in making plans. I believe in doing things, getting things done. And uh, I've seen a lot of that ever since. It seems to be almost a meme nowadays. Yep. Um, but I think there's still truth in it. Before we get started, here's something interesting that I literally just found the other day. Mm -hmm. So I'm flipping through Strength and Health. This is December. Uh, 1948. Okay. okay. And the very last page has a about half the page says, I resolve for 1949. These are the strength and health resolutions. Okay. They, they pointedly use that terminology, which is fine. I mean, I, I know what they're going for, and you know what they're going for. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, there's 10 of them. Let Why don't you me, go through them? I will go through them. So, I resolve for 1949, more strength and better health if you make and follow these resolutions in 1949 and for the years to come. Number one, I resolve to make weight training exercises a part of my life in the future. I will practice these vigorously enough at least two or three times a week that enforced breathing, more rapid circulation and perspiration will result. Number two, I resolve to obtain sufficient sleep, rest and relaxation, obtaining what has proven to be necessary in my own case. Number three, I resolve to pay more attention to my eating habits to be sure that my body receives ample quantities of the protective foods, milk and dairy products, eggs, fresh meat, leafy vegetables, and fruit in addition to the bodybuilding foods I usually consume. Number four, I resolve to avoid negative mental habits to really maintain a tranquil mind. I'll be kind and helpful, I'll be cheerful, and I won't worry, for all one can do is do one's best. There is no need to worry about it otherwise. Number five, I will pay more attention to the lesser, but vastly important health habits, cleanliness, inside and out of the body, good posture, fresh air and sunlight, healthful recreation in the open where possible. I'll take care of my teeth and visit the dentist regularly. Number six, once and for all, I'll quit smoking. It's a dirty, unnecessary, expensive habit. At the best, although it's health destroying, life shortening effects may be debatable. One thing for sure, it is not good for me and it is a habit I will be better it will be better for me to do without. Number seven, I'll cut out entirely or reduce to the bare minimum my consumption of alcoholic beverages, for I know this is one habit that is not good for me. Number eight, I will give up tea and coffee, for I have had plenty of time to note the unfavorable results the use of such beverages has brought to me in the past. I will av avoid nervousness, bad taste, lack of pep, and sleeplessness, by refraining from the use of these stimulants in the future. Number nine, I'll be sure that I do something each day that is beneficial for me, learn something new each day, improve my health each day, do a good deed every day, something to improve my body, my mind, and my entire life each day. Number 10, I'll live each day fully, a well-balanced life of physical and mental improvement and satisfying but wholesome pleasures. I'll make this year of 1949 the best of my life by following the few simple rules 
of strengthful, healthful living. I'll be a credit to myself, to my family, and to my country. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. Now, by the way, for any for anyone and everyone watching this, um, this is absolutely live, unrehearsed, spontaneous. I had no idea John was going to do that. And we had both written up some ideas and suggestions and tips before the show. And I think Strength and Health just hit several of them back in 1948. Yeah. I didn't yeah. remember that I had come across that until just just now when you mentioned resolutions okay i thought hey that would be uh timely given our topics and what's also interesting is that was 1949 mm -hmm. 70 years ago yeah and uh these the notes that we made hit a lot of the same points if not all of them i was struck by the same thing i was thinking that's fascinating because we we both have read that at some time in the past but didn't remember it specifically. And yet, as people will see, several of the points that were made in that article back in 1948 are, are things that we were going to cover in today's show. So that's really interesting. Um, the other thing that jumped out to me is, I, I think this is right. In that list of 10 resolutions, there were six, positive, I am going to do such and so. And there were four, uh, I won't say negatives, but there were four things phrased as I will not, or I will not do, or I will no longer do. And those four were an interesting list. Um, negativity, worry, I, I will not be, think negative thoughts, I will keep my mind. I will not think negative thoughts and I will not worry. I will not smoke. I will not drink alcohol. I, I think it's phrased, I will not drink alcohol or I will drink less alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then the other was um, either I will not drink coffee and tea or I it's will not drink as much. Something like that. Yeah. Tea and coffee. Yeah. So the four Stand, you know, people think of resolutions in terms of do not do something. You know, I, I, I won't eat chocolate anymore. I won't eat carbs anymore. I, you know, I, I won't, I won't drink as much or whatever. And only four of the ten tips focused on that, and the others were more affirmative of things to do. That's interesting. The other thing that uh, that struck me is. Um, December 1948, when Strength and Health was saying, don't smoke, they were completely going against the grain of popular culture, uh, popular media slash advertising, marketing, and medical advice. Because if you go back and look at the advertising from other magazines of that era, everyone in the world was telling you to smoke. Mm -hmm. You know, it was supposed to be a good thing for you. And Strength and Health was one of the few sources that said, no, don't do it. So kudos to them for that. Should we go ahead and start our list and let people see how they compare to the, uh, the Strength and Health list? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Do you want to hit uh, the first one on your list? Uh, mine is uh, something that I, I cover pretty much any time there's any good advice for any reason, this comes up in one way, shape or form. And that's to have a daily planner and make a to-do list. And it's my feeling that any success in anything has a foundation in time management. And you simply have to make better use of the time that's available to you. And this is, to me, this is a no brainer. This is an easy way to do that. That's a really good one. Now, let's go back and think, was that on the list? Not specifically, but talking about being a more productive person, mm -hmm. I, I think there's a connection there. I think it's fairly close. Uh, I, I may have shared the story um, in the past. I, I, I forget, and this may be new information to people. I just don't remember. But um, over the years, you know, I, I purchased, um, as you have, and we can see in the background, 
tons of old strength training, physical, physical culture, books and courses and, and things like that. Um, magazines, of course. And another thing that often came because people would often sell their whole collection of old strength stuff or physical culture stuff. A lot of those came with a lot of books about being a more productive person, being a more effective person, not just in strength training, but throughout the day in your entire life. And it was really interesting. And I, you know, I would look at this and I would think, well, here's somebody who spent part of their time reading about how to build strength and muscle, part of their time reading about how to eat better, diet and nutrition, and another part of the time filling their mind with inspiring thoughts about how to think better, how not to be negative, how not to be um, uh, you know, pessimistic, how to keep a, you know, a positive point of view, and how to be more productive in every single facet of your life. And I thought that that was really interesting, um, really ties things together in a very unique way that you don't see a lot of in the modern world. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a good one. Do you, um, do you buy some kind of prepackaged planner? Or do you just use a blank notebook or the backs of envelopes, or what do you do? I do. I have a. Um, let me find it here. I use a, a brand. Uh, it's called At a Glance. This is 2021. Uh, you can see it's got nice sharp corners and unsoiled pages. Uh, every page is a day. It's got a two dozen lines or so, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's got a nice uh, band to go around it. Sometimes it fills up with important papers or gift cards or things that I want at a, at a close proximity. Um, and uh, this is just a tool that I use. You can get this off Amazon for 20 bucks or something like that. But I always get one uh, between Christmas and New Year's and then start using it. And I find it to be um, the best 20 bucks I spend all year, to okay. be honest. And j just to be clear, are you talking about um, a journal for workout stuff, keeping track of your workouts? Or are you talking about everything? This is the to-do list. So if I have to um, pay a bill or return a phone call or uh, you know write a paper or whatever that gets put on the list, and then you know every day, uh, usually before I go to bed, I I sit and write down um, or I cross off anything that gets done during the day, and then later in the evening I'll make my to-do list for the next day. Uh, just carrying anything over that doesn't get done. And, so you, you have a regular system. I do. I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, I do have, I have a separate notebook and a separate system for keeping track of my workouts. Uh, that's a, that's its own thing entirely. But uh, this is just, you know, it's something to keep my mind uncluttered and, and make better use of my time. I mean, I've, I've mentioned this before, but if I have an extra 10 minutes, then I'm looking at my list saying, okay, what can I get done or what can I at least start uh, instead of just looking at kitten videos or, you know, Facebook or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, why do you do, um, why do you do a hard copy where you write it down as opposed to an electronic journal? I find it more meaningful. And uh, I think also another benefit, and I think we'll talk about this, in another call because it has far reaches on other things that we touch on is that when you write something in your own hand, it's, uh, there's more buy-in. Um, it becomes more um, uh, valuable. I mean, literally it's your, um, you know, this is, this is you on the page. This is, this is something that's the, so it, um, to me, I think that that's part of the process. I find it much more, meaningful than than just creating a spreadsheet or using a, a document or something like that because i think that literally as as you write things out by hand uh, that, that it's it becomes connected to you in a more intimate way that's interesting and that is something to uh, to cover in the future because i have a similar philosophy and um you know to the point where 
instead of asking Trudy to write something down so I remember to do it later, you know, if I'm in the middle of something and say, hey, I've got to do such and so, can you make a note? I don't do that. I do my own note because mm -hmm. for, for some reason, it sticks in my brain if it's my note. Mm -hmm. If it's someone else's note, you know, someone hands me a post-it note. When, when I was practicing law, people would always pass you a note, <laughs> you know, and you look at it and note doesn't work very well, <laughs> you know, or you're looking at it and you're like, huh, what? You know, there, there, there's some, um, this is off, off topic a little bit, but there's a, a story of um, a lawyer in England many, many years ago. Um, and in England, they have barristers and solicitors and the barristers do the trials and cross-examine witnesses and the solicitors sit next to them and they're not allowed to cross-examine witnesses, but they can pass notes to the barrister. So there's a trial, it's a, it's a criminal trial. Uh, the penalty is death by hanging and the lawyer defending the case, the barrister is cross-examining a witness and the solicitor hands him a piece of paper with a question to ask. And the lawyer, the barrister asks the question and gets exactly the wrong answer. And it's like, oops, it's all over. Their guy is obviously going to be found guilty. And he writes a note back to the solicitor and hands it to him. And the solicitor opens it up and reads, reads it. And the note says something to the effect of, when you get home, go upstairs, pull out your razor, cut your throat, because that's what you just did to our client. <laughs> As I said, that's not exactly on point, but it's a memorable story. So let, yeah, let's cover the, the whole idea of notes and, and note keeping. And also talk about the same points in the context of workout journals. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people do online journals versus keeping them in their own handwriting. And we can talk about the pros and cons of that sometime. Cool. So my first tip um, is actually two tips in one. Set challenging but realistic goals. And the reason I say it's two tips is one aspect is set realistic goals. And another aspect is set challenging goals. You have to have goals that are challenging because they have to motivate and inspire you. They have to pull you forward, make you work to accomplish them. And so they have to be challenging. They have to be something tough, something that you know, motivates you to do them. But on the other hand, they have to be realistic. And, you know, you sometimes see people, you know, I'm going to lose 50 pounds in 30 days, or I'm going to gain 20 pounds in a month, 20 pounds of solid muscle in a month, or I'm going to put 100 pounds on my squat or 50 pounds on my military press, you know, you know, whatever. It, it's, it's just not realistic, or it might be realistic, but not within the time frame that the person is selected. So you have to pick goals that are uh, challenging, but you also have to pick goals that are realistic. And they have to be realistic for you as an individual and for you at your present time of life. Um, the goals that I set for myself at age 63 are different than the goals that I would have set at 43 or 23 or, or when I was 15 or, or whenever. And I'm sure that's the same with everybody hope it's the same for everybody. It certainly should be the same for everybody. Um, so that's my number one, set challenging but realistic goals. And John, I'm gonna ask, is that on the list that was in Strength and Health or is it close to something in Strength and Health? Um, I think not specifically. But I think that it there's it's definitely has fingerprints in a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you looked at I resolve to make weight training exercises a part of my life. Um, I think you can't to me. Strength training, weight training is goal setting. So uh, there's really no point in doing it just randomly. Uh, in order to make it work, there has to be goals 
as a part of it. And so I think that's definitely a, a, a component of that particular one. Uh, some of them are uh, paying attention to health habits. Um, um, something, I, I, number nine is I'll be sure to do something each day that is beneficial for me. Learn something new, improve my health, do a good deed, something to improve my body, my mind, my entire life each day. Uh, that's also, to me, just another way of talking about goal setting. Mm -hmm. and, and there was the, um, the whole idea of being more productive. Mm -hmm. it certainly ties into goal setting. Yep. Well, what, what is your number two? My number two is emphasis on abdominal training. And I think that that's just something that makes a lot of sense anyway. But I think also um, a lot of success and just as a human being comes from, from just the way you look. You look in the mirror and you say, that's not bad. So, or if you look in the mirror and, and you see a, a big beer belly, you're just, you're, you're not going to feel good about yourself. So I think that that's an easy way to uh, attend to something that is meaningful, that is, um, that, that will allow you to kind of orient some other goals. I mean, all of a sudden that's going to have bearing on your diet, on your, uh, what in strength and health referred to as these other health habits. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, um, you know, when you, when you talk to somebody about how are you feeling? Well, to me, that's also, that's your stomach. You know, your stomach kind of dictates a lot of the other areas of, of development, of, of uh, you know, motivation and so on and so forth. So to me, it's, it's, the, uh, it's literally the center of, of your existence in a way. And I think it just, it makes a lot of sense to attend to that in your training. And um, if you also look at what people do when they say they're training their abdominals, they do some crunches or they do a plank and all that has its, has its place in some degree. But what I'm talking about also is training your abs like most people train their bench press. So to your point, have a goal, have, it, have something you can work towards from a performance standpoint. Do, I don't know, go from 10 sit-ups to 50 sit-ups or 100 sit-ups or something like that. And that'll be reflected in, in the, you know, in, in how things look. So let's drill down into that just a little bit for people. Is that something that you would advise trying to do all in one jump or work gradually? Like if you're going from 10 sit-ups to 100, how would you suggest doing it? I would suggest to anybody just see, sit down tonight in front of the TV, if if, um, if that's your thing, and see how many sit-ups you get. And I think a lot of people will be surprised. I think a lot of people will be surprised at just how weak that area is. And that'll indicate that, hey, this is something you need to pay more attention to. And what what, what kind of sit-up, what kind of sit-up would you suggest? I think for a lot of people, uh, either just a basic gym class sit-up or you, you hook your front of your feet underneath the edge of the couch. I mean, that's another way to do it. Um, tried, tried and true. Um, crunches, I suppose, will work too, although not the kind of the rapid fire uh, ballistic crunches, but still slow controlled, a good contraction, down slow, all that kind of stuff. And see where you're at. I mean, really set a baseline to find out where you're at right now. And in doing so, you'll also understand what you'll need to do going forward. One thing that people can do, and, and I, I'm surprised that this doesn't get more, you know, more uh, traction out there because it's such a simple but effective thing, is basically if you're watching TV, which I guess nowadays is watching streaming services on your, on your computer screen. Um, if you're watching some form of media, usually in the evening, that's what people typically do. You can make that a complete workout session. I mean, you can just do one set of sit-ups and then rest for a minute or two and then do a plank and then rest a bit and do a side plank and then do the other side and then do more sit-ups or crunches or leg raises or whatever. 
Um, you can just do abdominal vacuums or tense the abdominals, hold, let them go, tense, hold, let them go, then go back and do more of the more difficult exercises. But you could literally, you know, do 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes spaced with rest periods and actually make that, that watching time where you're just being a, you know, a lump, that's the couch potato thing. You can actually make that a, a productive training session. Very much so. And, and very easily. Absolutely. And another thing worth noting and something to keep in mind, I don't, I don't have the science behind it, but if you read a lot of the early physical training books and articles and uh, we're talking late 1800s early 1900s they would have sit-ups they would suggest sit-ups but they would sit they would instead of focusing on the abdominal musculature they would say well you do this particular exercise because it massages the internal organs and helps digestion mm -hmm. yeah. I, I can't speak to any of that i don't know if there's any truth to that or not but it's conceivable that there's some stuff there that makes sense in that in that regard and it certainly couldn't hurt. Virtually everyone who wrote about physical training or physical culture from the late 1800s into the 1930s or 40s, at the very least, and possibly after that, I mean, all the pioneers of physical culture and strength training wrote about that, and they phrased it in terms of your internal organs cannot exercise themselves you have to do the exercise for them and sit ups and leg raises and, and really any kind of abdominal movement were viewed as ways to massage, massage, strengthen um, the internal organs. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I, I don't know the physiology on that. I don't think anyone's ever in, in the modern world. I don't think people are doing, you know, really good, detailed research to drill down on that, but it sure makes sense. Um, okay, so that's a good one. Um, and probably timely because, I, I mean, not, not timely, but it's not uncommon. Everybody is thinking about or talking about, you know, knocking some, some flab off the waist, cutting down, trimming up, you know, getting in better shape. I mean, that's a standard New Year's resolution, if you will. But I think your twist on it is, is significantly different. So my number two is one that's going to sound real familiar to people, um, having heard this much in the podcast, make a sensible and realistic plan. You know, you don't just jump into something and start doing things. You plan it. You sit down with paper and pencil. You start putting ideas on paper, you set that paper aside, you take another paper, you take the best ideas, you write them down, you set that aside, you look at things, you say, what do I want to prioritize? What's the most important for me? What do I really want to accomplish? What's the goal that's going to pull me forward as fast as possible as we go into 2021? How do I get there? What do I do? And you plan it, you plan everything, you put it on paper and you know exactly what you're going to do. Um, you know, what's the line? People don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Mm -hmm. You know, well, that's, that's very true. And, and the other side of that, the other, you know, critical words in there, your plan has to be sensible and it has to be realistic. And, and again, if, your plan is to train three hours every day, 365 days of the year, and do maximum effort, super high intensity, balls to the wall in every single set you do, and add 10 pounds to the bar every day, and double your reps, and yada, 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 and all the, you know, the silly stuff out there, you're going to crash and burn in about two days. Mm -hmm. And... That's not an example of sensible and realistic planning. Your, your planning needs to have an element of progression, but it has to be slow cooking progression. One rep at a time, add small amounts of weight, add 
one more set. Gradually work up to another set. Drop back, add weight, build back up. Things like that. Things that you and I cover in you know, all of our courses and, and books and training materials and things. Um, and we'll cover more in the podcasts in the future. But it has to be slow cooking progression to be a sensible and realistic plan. What's your number three? It is set daily goals. And a part of that is the secret of the big red X, which I have talked about before in emails and, and articles and things of that nature. I've heard that this is something that Jerry Seinfeld did um, before he was well known is that he would sit down and say, all right, I'm gonna sit down and write a joke every day. And every day that I do, I'm going to take a big wall calendar and I'm going to put a big red X on the calendar. And he's got it on his wall. So he stares at it every day. And he said that not every joke was great, but if you sit down and write one every day, sooner or later, you're going to find some good ones. And I think that's a great lesson. And I've used that uh, mentality for a variety of things to accomplish a variety of things. I think that that regardless of your to-do list and regardless of your training goals, I think there's certain things that you should be doing every day just to stay sharp, just to, uh, you know, some of that is good and good for you, but then it's also something that you can work towards uh, and be proud of yourself for being productive every single day. It is the, the big red X idea something that you actually physically do. You have a, you know, a calendar and you have to yep. put yep. a Big red X through the day. I do. I do. You can get a um, a cheap wall calendar at the um, one of the office stores, Staples or uh, Office Max or one of those uh, for I don't know ten bucks or something like that. But uh, you know, I, I literally take a big red sharpie and and for when I hit my goals, I put a big red X. And then you know, you're looking at that and saying, boy, I don't want to. Sometimes it'll be the, I guess you could say, fear of the day that comes when you miss out and you're going to just look at it and just be embarrassed. Like, man, I wish I could, I wish I could have done something about that. Well, you know, if you have that in front of you, something tangible, something that's always there, then maybe it, it keeps you going when you might, there might be no reason to. Interesting. Interesting. Um, it's interesting that you would, that you actually use the big calendar and all that because that's something that I've done. Mm. I, I don't think you and I have ever talked about these things before, but it's interesting how many similarities there are. But I've I've done that, um, both in connection with the legal work that I used to do, um, in connection with writing, uh, dinosaur writing and, and things like that, and um, in connection with working out. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I've, I've used that before, and it, it's very effective. It's a, it's a great thing to do if you're doing one of these 30-day challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're doing a 30-day challenge, that idea of having a calendar and putting the red X through every day, you hit whatever you're supposed to do for the cal, you know, for the challenge. You know, you've got a squat challenge. You do some form of squat, either weighted or unweighted or whatever, mm -hmm. every single day for 30 days. You know. Put a calendar up there and you know mark it off. And I guarantee that if you're doing that and it's 11.50 p.m. and you're lying in bed and you haven't done what you're supposed to do, you're gonna think, holy crap, I can't go to sleep. Wait a minute. And you know, you go run out and you know you do a set of squats or whatever, and then you go find that calendar, you put the red X on. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful tool. Or if I miss a day, I put a big zero. And so, you know, ah. that's another thing where it's like, oh man, you know, I got to look at that now. Ah. So it works both ways. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and I had not heard that story about Jerry Seinfeld before, but that's, that's a good example. I'm sure there's other examples of the same principle. That's just, that's one I happen to know of, but. It, it's it's a good one and it's an easy one and it's one that most people don't take advantage of. Well, I, I'm going to throw out to all of our listeners. Here's a simple to do. Implement the red X challenge. 
and do something that has you sitting there with that hard copy calendar and a red pen and put in the red X in and do it for 30 days and let us know, put a comment down, shoot us an email or do both, doesn't matter. Let us know and let other people know how it works for you. And related, if you've already been doing it, let us know. And if you know of anyone in addition to Jerry Seinfeld who's done it, let us know. Because I bet that there are other examples of people out there who are very driven, very goal oriented people who get things done in their lives, who've done this, who, who do it, who still mm -hmm. do it. So that's a good one. Um, my number three is related to my number two, which again was make a sensible and realistic goal. And my number three is start out easy and build up slowly and progressively. Um, can't say that enough. And the reason I can't say it enough is because people don't do it. They think that suddenly on January 1, it's time to go from you know, either zero or 10 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour. And that always results in a massive crash and wreck. It, it, it's just, it's not the way the human body is designed to work or the way the human mind is designed to work. You know, it's much better to start slowly and work progressively and steadily towards your goal. And, and one part of that that's very important is discipline. You need to discipline yourself to delay the immediate ego gratification of having some kind of super humongous, heroic superhero workout. Just have a workout. And the next time you do it, make it harder. And the time after that, make it a little harder. And so on. And work slowly and methodically and progressively and intelligently. And you end up eventually having those incredible, insane killer superhero workouts. But by the time you get there, your body and your mind are ready for that level of intensity. I think that's really important. I think that's probably the one thing that most people do wrong when they do the New Year's resolution thing is they, they jump into something that is completely impossible. Um, it goes with diet and nutrition too. I mean, one of the simplest diet nutrition things that you can do that makes a huge impact for people is a very simple one. Stop drinking your calories. In other words, you cut back on the booze or cut it out. Mm -hmm. You cut out on all this, you cut back on or cut out to zero all the sports drinks, all the drinks you buy that are loaded with sugar, Energy all, drinks. The, all the colas and pops and Pepsis and, and you know, all of that stuff. I don't mean to single Pepsi out, but all the colas, all the pops, all the soft drinks, all the sugary stuff, just drop it. Drop the fruit juices because you're drinking calories and just eat food, drink water, and suddenly without doing anything differently, you'll cut 500 to 1,000 calories out of your daily diet like that. Mm -hmm. That's a very easy thing to do. And, you know, I mean, it's a lot easier than going on some kind of, you know, really difficult, torturous diet. So that's an example of a slow, easy, gradual step as opposed to switching your diet, you know, turning your diet completely on its head and living on something that is completely a different way of eating and essentially a starvation way of eating for you. Training is the same way, but it's the flip side. Everybody tries to go too high in volume, do too much, or to go too hard, too high intensity, go too heavy before they're ready for it. And that's the problem. You need to do the slow and progressive thing. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not even gonna ask because I know that set daily goals and start out easy, build up slowly and progressively was on the strength and health list in one form or another, or at least implicit in some of the ideas such as do something 
healthful every day. Mm -hmm. um, what's your number four? And did you see it on the strength and health list when you went through that list? Um, not specifically, but you could make the case that it's there in spirit. But my number four was read a lot. Um, you know, my feeling is that if you want to be successful, uh, it's not just a, a, a suggestion, but it's a requirement that you have to be well read, not just in your area of interest, but in a lot of different areas. And so uh, I noticed that if there's peaks in a feeling of being successful and of being in confidence and control, that seems to coincide with, if, uh, with a voracious uh, reading appetite. And it's not just stuff on strength training. Uh, you know, I'm reading fiction and uh, things on nutrition and, uh, you know, I'm, I've gotten, I've been reading a lot of biographies and autobiographies, autobiographies of football coaches recently. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting lessons in all areas that can be had in, in all those books. So uh, I just feel that, that a lot of people get to the point where they think they know enough. And uh, I feel like that that's, in my personal opinion, in my experience, that's just not the way to go. There's always things to be learned. And uh, you never know when some small detail is going to turn into something meaningful. Um, you know, an example of that for me was uh, was the, um, if you're familiar with the Bone Strength Project, which is something that I've been engaged in for several years now, but that part of the reasoning behind that, the rationale behind that came from a book on sports performance uh, that was not really, it wasn't about strength training, uh, although in a, in a tangential sense, but it was something that, that oriented my mind in a certain way. And I started to look around and find other related factors and put them all together until I came up with something that I find has been just tremendous for me. So, you know, that's a, a perfect example of, of why you want to keep doing your homework. So you were saying you actually came up with the idea of the bone strength training, not from something that was specifically related to strength training, but from another source. It was a book about uh, sports performance and it had some data on, on um, the amount of, uh, or there was a statement that a two, I think it was two kilograms of bone tissue can support five kilograms of muscle tissue. Uh, I forget the specific ratio, but there was a, it, it highlighted that relationship and it started the wheels turning in my mind saying, well, if we can increase one, then perhaps we can increase the other if there's a, a constrained optimization relationship there. So that, uh, you know, and then I took little bits and pieces of other things that I'd seen written in various publications and books and kind of formulated a, an idea and I wasn't sure if it was going to work, but here we are five years later and found out that there was some very beneficial and valuable stuff there. So you never know when you're going to happen across one paragraph that's going to set you off on a course of uh, discovery. Interesting. Um, when, when I was a kid, I grew up reading a whole lot of strength training articles by Bradley J. Steiner. And a lot of them focused on the metal aspects of strength training. Um, you know, he, he was very well read in a lot of areas that he used to develop better ways to train. And he always recommended that in addition to strength training, people read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, which is you know, the classic how to succeed in business or how to succeed in life in general book, perhaps the best ever in that genre. Um, and it's very directly transferable to strength training. And the other book that he often recommended was uh, a long essay by William James, a philosopher who uh, taught at, I believe, Harvard University from like 1880, 1890, turn of the century, et cetera. Uh, the brother of um, Henry James, the novelist. And 
William James wrote an essay called The Energies of Men. And basically it was how people respond in emergency situations. What, what triggers those who survive and what triggers those who don't and how you can start thinking about using the survival energy in day-to-day -day life and you know, making your day-to-day -day life better. And of course, Steiner took that and just you know, ran with it in terms of strength training. But you know, it's absolutely fascinating that here he is writing, when I was a kid, he's writing in the 1970s, 70, 80, 90 years after William James, Harvard professor, is writing about you know, the esoteric um, you know, abilities of people in survival situations. And Steiner somehow went back, found that, read it, and then used it. And I think there are many, many uh, more examples we could list. Mm -hmm. Another one that comes to mind, um, I saw this in something that your dad wrote on the Iron League. Arthur Jones, I think your dad reported that Arthur Jones would read one book a day. He claimed right? to, yes, yeah. And that's, and, and not just strength training books because, you know, hey, newsflash, uh, there are not 365 of them. They wouldn't keep you going for a whole year. That's right. Uh, but Arthur was also another perfect example of taking concepts that were in other areas and then applying them to strength training in order to illustrate the principles. And I think he did so very successfully. And, and I think that's just another rational justification for being well read in general, not just in strength training, but in many different areas. Yeah. I've read a. Um, um, an obituary for one of my high school wrestling coaches. Um, unfortunately, he passed away in his 70s. Um, but I, I read this obituary and it talked about this man who, who in his own wrestling career had been an extremely good uh, champion caliber wrestler, both in high school and college, and then became a coach who coached state champions in Illinois. I mean, he was extremely good coach. And yet his other interests included a variety of reading, um, outdoors and wilderness adventure travels and trekking and, and camping and all of that. Um, gardening, he cultivated roses. He was a rose gardener, you know, at a very elite level. Um, a fan of the symphony orchestra, uh, uh, you know, just loved classical music and extremely well read in all these different areas. And I was thinking, boy, that's, that's a really interesting combination to just have all those different things going on in your life and being a student of them simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I had never known about any of those other than the wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, that was the only part of his life that I knew. And it was, you know, it was really interesting to see how well-rounded he was. And um, if you look at a whole lot of famous people, people who've been very successful, people who've accomplished great things in their lives, a lot of them have that pattern of endless curiosity, always reading, always learning. And, and not just in their little niche, but in a whole different, a whole, you know, all different areas. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's a good one. Read a lot. Um, and I guess that means it's time for me with, num with my number four. Uh, again, I'm talking about planning and programming and being sensible and thoughtful and trying to avoid common pitfalls. And so my number four is, and again, we're talking about when, once you've made a plan and a program or a guide on how to get there, Make adjustments as needed because you're always going to have to make adjustments, but stick to the program. And that's a totally different way of doing things than what most people do, which is they, they plan a program out, they start to follow it, something happens, there's one workout where they, they can't add five pounds to their squats, they can't get 
10 reps instead of nine reps. They, they can't do whatever they had programmed themselves to do. And they are immediately thinking, oh my God, that's it, it's all over. I've got to stop, I've got to find a new program. You know, I've got to start, you know, go back to square one. And it's like, no, you stick to the program and you keep going forward. If your program calls to get 10 reps in a particular exercise and you only get nine, that doesn't mean you need a new program. Mm. It means that you need to hit the goal in your next workout, but you have to stick to the program. And the other thing that you have to do, I think I may be the person who coined the phrase on this, but it's a good phrase. So if I didn't coin it, kudos to whoever did. Program hopping. Mm -hmm. You cannot be a program hopper. Program hopper is someone who jumps from one workout to another. Anything they see on the internet, immediately, boom, that's their new program. Yep. You know, and it's like, no, 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 no. Your program is the one that you designed to achieve success. That's your program. Your job is to stick to it. Implement it and stick to it. Mm -hmm. And not to be a program hopper, period. You know, end of discussion. So again, that's that's something that I see in emails from people all the time. You know, you, it, it's a very, very common fault. I, I think if you were to study, if you were to study all the social media postings from January through February or March, you would see examples of you know, January 1, I'm starting my new program. Here it is. Look at me. It's awesome. It's great. It's wonderful. And by the end of January or early February, they're doing something totally different. Yep. Um, Randy Strawson had a phrase he used in an email once, something about um, kids bouncing up and down on his uh, new pink pogo stick. Uh, you're too young to remember pogo sticks, but they were a big deal when I was a kid. <laughs> but uh, you know, kids bouncing up and down on the new pink pogo stick, and a week or two later, you know what? That pogo stick is in the trash heap of history, and the, the kid will never be on it again. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of people treat strength training programs. Um, Randy, if you're listening to this, that was a great phrase. <laughs> so, anyhow, don't be the kid on the pink pogo stick. What's your uh, your number five? Uh, number five is one that was addressed specifically in the strength and health resolutions, and that's make sleep a priority. And I say that not just giving advice to everybody else, but also to cement it in my own mind as well, because I'm guilty of that too. Um, I think sleep is it certainly has bearing on your results from your workout program, but I think there are things in place now, social media, phones, uh, screen time that starts to eat into your that your sleep schedule, whereas 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, it was, uh, you know, an extra hour a day was could be devoted to sleep. And now all of a sudden, you take an hour a day uh, out of your schedule during the day. And that's an that's a whole nother night of sleep on a per week basis. So mm -hmm. it's easy for that to be chipped away and that'll have direct bearing on your results from your training program. Sleep is incredibly important and a whole lot of people neglect it. Um, take it for granted and that may work for a while in your life, but eventually there comes a point where getting enough quality sleep every night is, is a bit of a challenge, mm -hmm. you know, and um, you're right. Uh, they did talk about that in the 1948 uh, list of resolutions for 1949. And they, uh, they were talking about some important things that, you know, that's where they said, it all, you know, it all ties together. They said, maintain a tranquil mind, which, which by the way, was a phrase that I saw in training articles all the time when I was a kid maintain a tranquil mind. That was the phrase, tranquil. And you always saw it back then and you never see it now. Interesting. But 
going back to the, uh, the strength and health list, you know, they said, avoid negativity, don't worry. Okay, well, if you avoid negativity and you don't worry, you sleep better. You get to sleep better. You fall asleep more quickly. They said, don't smoke. What's something that smoking affects? Affects your sleep. Don't drink alcohol or cut back on alcohol. Well, from the sleep perspective, that's excellent advice because too much alcohol, which can be any amount for some people, actually keeps you awake. Um, and then coffee and tea, uh, again, they said, cut it out if you can, otherwise cut back. And that's really important, particularly for older people. And one thing that a lot of people find on the coffee and tea front, there may be a time in your life where you can kind of live on coffee all day long or live on coffee and tea, and it doesn't seem to have an effect on you. In fact, you may think it's good. You know, I'm, I'm having some coffee before my workout. It's gonna, you know, juice me up, get me going. Um, but there comes a time, I guarantee, where more than one or two cups of coffee at breakfast is all that you can handle for the whole day or else you can't sleep. And I'm not the only person age 60 and up who's into the physical culture lifestyle, who's monitoring these things and how they affect you. I mean, other people have said the same thing. I think there's an article that um, the late Peter Gates submitted to the Dinophiles and I've been running it in a series and he either mentioned this in last month's part of the series or in the, uh, uh, the final installment in the series that we're running in the, uh, the January Dinophiles. He said or he said something, wrote something to the effect of uh, he's cut back to, I think he said, has cut back to one cup of coffee a day because otherwise it affects his sleep. And a lot of people have found the same thing. So that's something to really keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind in that regard is um, staring at the computer screen. Mm -hmm. You know, whether, well, computer screen or cell phone screen, if you're sitting there online and then trying to jump into bed and close your eyes and go to sleep, it's not going to happen. Uh, it's much better and it's almost a cliche to say this nowadays, but it's, it's very true. Um, turn the screens off, put them away an hour before the time that you wanna to go to bed and do something else. Reading is a great example. And I'm talking about holding a book in your hands or a, a magazine or a newspaper or whatever, hold it in your hands and actually read it, but just stay away from the screens mm -hmm. and particularly stay away from social media because Social media is just nothing but an endless series of dopamine um, hijackings uh, and adrenaline hijackings. It either makes you happy uh, because someone liked something you put on Instagram or Facebook or wherever, or you see something on social media that makes you mad. But either way, it chemically, uh, hormonally interferes with your ability to get a good night's sleep. So avoid that, it's easy to do. Yep. Um, it'll make a big difference. Yeah. So do, do you have um, any sleep things that you do like, you know, dark curtains or, you know, some kind of sleep sounds, uh, you, know, you know, anything like that? Believe it or not, I wear a sleep mask. Ah, okay. Uh, the one, the brand is called Manta, and I'm sure that after reading this, you'll see many ads pop up, pop up on your screen, or listening to this, you'll hear, you'll see many ads pop up. Uh, I thought it was just, for whatever reason, if there's any light whatsoever, even if it's, you know, the clock radio, um, it somehow affects me. So I like total darkness and works for me. You know, I'm not saying that's something that is for everybody, but that's just one of those things that you come to know yourself and try it out and see if it works. And that's something that has worked for me. That's interesting. Um, Trudy uses a sleep mask. Um, so do several of our other family members. Um, 
I don't, but uh, our room is situated so that there very little light gets in um, in the evening or even in the early morning, as long as the, the, the uh, curtains are drawn. And Trudy got some blackout curtains, some really thick, dark curtains, and they make a tremendous difference. I mean, there's like no light comes in at all and you do sleep better. You know, you know it's, it's really interesting. The other interesting thing that I've discovered having moved from Louisville um, to much farther north, in the state of Washington and actually Northern Washington so close that, you know, I can, you know, just walk three miles and I'm as far North as you can go without stepping into the Juan de Fuca Strait and swimming to Canada. Okay. So it's really different here than in Louisville. And one way that it's different is the days are shorter and Darkness hits an hour or two earlier, and it is darker in the morning. And, and essentially, you've got about two more hours of dark than you would do if you were in, than you would have if you were in Louisville. You also have um, in a, you know in a small town of ten thousand, which is where we are now, uh, compared to Louisville, a uh, city of a million, you've got much less light. And so it is enormously darker and it changes your sleep pattern. If, particularly if you, you get off the social media, you, 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 you're not looking at the screen. What you find is that you, you develop a, a much more natural sleep pattern. It gets dark and your body starts to produce melatonin and you start thinking it's time to go to sleep. And if you're able to sleep through until you wake up and not rely on a, an alarm clock. You wake up at a very appropriate time for you and you're completely rested. Um, you know, you wake up ready to go. It makes a huge difference. And it's, it's a really interesting thing that I only experienced because we moved. So well worth, um, well worth paying attention to, to your sleep hygiene as people call it. And there's been a lot of research in the last couple of years on sleep and the effect of sleep and for anything from shooting free throws to standardized tests to, um, I'm, I'm sure you could find any number of examples, but sleep is a factor that will directly correlate to a greater likelihood of success. So, Absolutely. I would like to see a really well done strength study with you know two groups doing the same exercise program and with one group they really focus on sleep hygiene good sleep habits and on the other that it's just whatever and you compare the two groups after 12 weeks or six months or something i think i think that you would see much better gains in strength and muscle mass from the group that focuses on on quality sleep getting enough quality sleep. I would imagine, yep. Yeah, so that'll be, that'll be something for someone to research and then you can post the results of the research study or post the research study link um, in the comments. So my number five um, is, um, is something that I've said more than once. And if you, uh, you know, if you follow my writing, you probably read this. When in doubt, remember, less is more. And that sounds trite, sounds like a cliche, but it is absolutely true. And I think it's true for many aspects of life in general, but I know that it's true in strength training and muscle building and physical culture. Um, and this goes back to that whole idea of setting realistic goals, realistic plans, building up slowly, and progressively, I, I once read, and I forget, I forget who wrote this. I think it may have been Bradley J. Steiner. I'm pretty sure it was Steiner, but it was something to the effect of any fool 
where the paper and pencil can sit and write down a workout in two minutes that would take hours for anyone in the world to do. And probably if you took another minute to write the workout out, no one in the world could do it. I'm paraphrasing and uh, perhaps embroidering a bit the original thought, but you know, the idea is it's easy to write something that's impossible to do. You don't want to do that. You, you, you want to come up with training programs that are possible to do and that you can do without outrunning your recovery ability. Mm -hmm. that, that's critically important. And that's why, you know, I always write about abbreviated training programs, ultra abbreviated training programs, focusing on rest, focusing on recovery. You know, that's one reason you talk about um, making sleep a priority. You know, these things all tie together and they all go to the idea of maximizing recovery and recuper recuperation as opposed to training for the sake of training. Um, and those are, are lessons people should know, but they often tend to forget them. And the time of year that they forget them the most often is right now. When everybody's in the, it's January, I've got to do something new, different, dramatic, and, and superhuman. And that does tend to lead people into the overtraining trail. Yep. So I think we got five, from, five tips from you, five tips from me, 10 tips from strength and health. So we had intended to give 10 tips, but we've given 20 tips. Uh, that's not bad. Yeah, I, I think um, I think that would be. Cool. So should we stop here and um, you know let people think about what we've written and again possibly add comments, send emails, think about ways to implement these various do's and don'ts in their own personal lives and in their training and uh, sign off for now. Yeah, I think uh, episode two uh, was uh, and it's another good one. And um, people have questions on anything we've covered here. We'll see about, uh, I think in the future, we'll have shows which we can address a lot of those questions more readily. Uh, so, and that'll be one of the purposes of the podcast in general. So if there's something that you're wondering about, um, you can reach out and let us know and we'll see what we can do. Sounds like a plan. So long, everybody. Take care.